Um, so this may also be uploaded in eBird as well, but since it's, all, it's also in iNaturalist, note that it's actually shared with a couple of other projects as well. So you can, uh, you can add things to multiple projects or link, I should say, a given observation with multiple projects if it's relevant. But so we notice it has been added to the adopt a loop project. Hey. And it has its observation field completed right down here as well. The place of observation site number. So that's just a little bit about, um, you know, kind of ways that you can get in and, and tweak and edit things. And then the last thing I do want to talk about before we go to open Q&A is how to assist with identifications, because this is, again, a really important part of this whole iNaturalist platform and how it, it really works best. So I find that I far prefer to do this process on the website because it's just set up better to do this. You can, we'll show you really quickly how you can add identifications through your phone but you really have to kind of do it piece by piece. The website's really the best way to do this. Um, so my recommendation is to grab your favorite beverage, a stack of field guides if you are so inclined and whatever your favorite snack is and settle in for a little while because it is a bit of an addictive process. So when you log in, there is an identify tab at the top and you're in the gray menu. And when you click on that, it will take you to whatever your default site location is. So when I did this screenshot, it was set to North America. Now it takes me to Texas. And it's just showing me a whole bunch of things that in this case showed up as new things that needed identification for North America. And so, hey, check that out. That's pretty cool. There's something in there that's just listed as a bird, but I think I can help with narrow this down a little bit. So. Looking at the profile of that, it's I, I feel pretty confident that it's an Ani. But for the sake of argument, let's say I look at it and I go, oh, that's from Costa Rica. Maybe I feel a little less confident in saying, you know, specifically which Ani it is, but I still feel pretty good about putting it into that group, which is narrower than birds. So all to say, I can go in and say, I'm going to add it to this genus. And when you add an ID, it will show up at, in this little pop-up uh, window that you can see. And so what we've done is we've narrowed this down. So all to say, using this as an example, that you don't have to go all the way down to species level with identifications. You can just simply be narrowing things down. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out is that there are you have the ability to filter. So if you have a particular taxa group or organism that you are really passionate about or that you uh, want to get a little bit more practice on making IDs, you can always kind of filter by that. Um, sometimes you actually run into things that are listed as unknown. Uh, in this case, this was kind of a, a fun gimme because it's like, well, I actually can identify this all the way down to species level. Doesn't always happen, but um, sometimes you get lucky and are able to kind of really put it in a nice box like that. But even the process of going through and finding those things that are unknown and putting them in a narrower bin, you know, for example, um, that something is a, uh, you know, Asteraceae as opposed to just plant. That is helping this general process. Um, so again, my suggestion with identifications, when I make identifications for others, I tend to be more conservative than when I slap an identification on something of mine. So I'm not afraid to have, to put something out there on my own observations and say, maybe in the comment or in the notes a description, um, I'm 50-50 on this, I think it's this species versus that. Please, you know, if, if folks um, have any, any thoughts on this, please weigh in. So I'm not afraid sometimes to go a little further on my own observations, but when I'm adding things to other people's, I tend to be much more conservative unless I'm really, really sure, then I'll keep it at a more general level. So that's just my, my own preference. Um, so when you're in this identify page, when you have gone and reviewed something, it will actually gray it out to let you know that you have in fact interacted with it. And then you can move on to the next one. And you can just keep doing that for hours until you finally run out of snacks or you know your spouse taps you on the shoulder and says it's time to get up from the computer.
which happens sometimes. Um, so what we're looking at now is how you would go in the phone app and add an identification. So again, this process is a lot less um, kind of streamlined than it is on the website. You have to actually go in observation by observation if you want to do this, but you can pull up someone else's observation in the phone app and what you'll see here, this little menu section that has these three sections, the default is usually the uh, information. But if you click over here on the comment icon, it will take you to where the IDs are and where you can then add yours. So if you scroll down the screen a little bit, you can either agree if there's an identification that's already been made. You can even, you don't have to add an ID, you can simply add a comment or you can suggest in a different identification if you think it actually is something else. And once you have done whatever it is, add an ID or a comment, then uh, you will actually see that show up when the page refreshes on your phone screen and you'll see your comment or ID added below what's already been uh, put in. So that is what I had prepared, um, expecting that we were probably going to have quite a bit of um, question and, and answer that folks wanted to do. Um, so just in general, if you have kind of technical iNaturalist questions or questions about any of the projects that Nature Trackers administers or things like that, please feel free to reach out to either myself or my teammate, Craig Hensley, who is based out in the San Antonio area. Um, either one of us will be more than happy to answer some of those questions and try and get you the information you need to keep on keeping on. So that said, let's um, get back to some of those questions and see what folks wanted to know. All right, let me, I'll go through the chat box questions first. Um, Bill asked about uploading observations on eBird, how we connect them back to the Adopt-A-Loop program. And also if they can be a little more specific for large state parks such as Goose Island uh, for the site of the location of the observation, if that can be narrowed down more than it was just at Goose Island State Park. So the eBird question, I. Josh, I'm going to defer that to you guys, um, okay. to you and Shelly, because that's not something that if we, if you and I, if we, we'd all talked about it, like, I'm afraid I don't quite remember, like, how y'all were. We did. We are just planning to pull the observations from a date range in that hotspot. So if cool. you're, if you're whatever site you're at, likely a lot of them will have, will already be a hotspot just under that site name. So we'll go back for, you know, quarter one of 2021 and pull observations from that site name. Awesome. And then I guess for you, the <laughs> as far as narrowing down a more specific location in large state parks, because obviously, you know, some of our, our parks are several thousand acres. Um, is that part of the geo tracking as far as like a, a more accurate latitude longitude observation um is that i guess i guess my question would be if that's kind of in contrast to the whole state park being a wildlife trail site mm -hmm. yeah because we're asking yeah, for the my, specific site yeah. I, have, I have a location for goose island but i wasn't sure whether there was any you know lower um uh site identifications to a subset to that and is that is that an ebird or inat question uh that's an inat question okay so that's one of the things that's really nice about having for that observation having that lat long come in is that we could have dozens of things that fit within that bigger site whatever its number is but on if we were to map them, we would see all of those different yeah, sub locations. So, so that information is preserved. It's just a, it's kind of also a nice way to be able to group them under that site um, umbrella. But we don't lose the the very particular uh, location information. Okay. All right. Let's see. We'll go through the. Uh, Sandra was next. Have your hand raised. 
Um, Hi, yes, uh, Josh, Josh, I was wondering. There's two Sandras, I guess. Oh. Um. Sandra Wheeler, I think, was next on the list. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, my question is about something Josh you said earlier about eBird and also with INAP. Um, normally, what I do is I'm a long term eBird user. So I always have lists going to eBird. But if I have photos, I also put them in INAP. So are you saying we should only put them in one or the other? No, I think it'd be great to put them in both. Okay. I just want to confirm that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, Gail, have your hand raised. I have an extremely basic question. I was playing with the website during break and I can't figure out how to join the adopt a loop project. Oh, OK, uh, <laughs> let me see if I, this is the, tr the problem with being a part of all these projects already is it's like, uh, OK. Let me see. Um, get the right browser window open here. I can understand uh, that I can probably add something to it, but I don't know how to how to join it. I'm gonna share screen again here and see if we can get into the website. So if if, if all of this goes completely sideways <laughs> with my uh, bandwidth, I apologize. But we're at the we're the last little bit here, so it's this is why I never do things live because I don't have enough knock knock jokes to fill the time when <laughs> we're waiting for the for web pages to load. Um, let me make this bigger um, and see if this works on all of them. Hey, good. Okay, so what you should be seeing is my browser window. And we should be looking at the practice adopt a loop project. And here's again the problem um, because I'm uh, have set things up and I'm a member where it should say join this project. It says edit project for me. But if you have not joined it, then you should see where my mouse is up here at the top. It should say um, join this project. Well, see, I was at the at the GTWT adopted loop project. Ah, this one. The official, yeah. And it doesn't yep. look like that. <laughs> Let me put oh. the, I'll drop the URL in the chat box. Make sure you are. In the right place. Looking at the correct, yeah. Because it should look the same when you click on that URL. Well, I can't figure out. I'm sorry, but I've been sitting here trying to figure out how to get to the chat box. And I'm on an iPad. Oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and usually I can figure yeah, which it out. Doesn't I know mine is different it, than everyone it, else. Yep, it's a different layout for that. Um, I will can email you, see you my, the link. Can, can you see okay. my screen? Yes. Let me make this even bigger. Oh, oh bother. It's see. not doing it. OK. It's um it's up here. So this is I've highlighted the URL. Okay. So you'll so it'll be um you know inaturals.org forward slash projects forward slash gtwt uh, a dash adopt dash a dash loop. Okay. OK, well, let me work with that for a little while. I think uh, what I did was I just went into iNaturalist. And then I had it search for. Projects. And it came up with that project, but what it came up with was something that looked more like. Um, a list of what all the observations were. That sort of thing. Oh, did you? Oh, it didn't did you take search? you to the home page. It didn't did take you, you to the home page. No. Ah, uh, okay. Because I think um, so. The URL should take you to the to the main page, but the other okay. the way to search for it would be to go up here to community. Okay. And then click on projects. 
And then what okay. it should do is give you a page that looks something like this. Like this will change this, okay. you know, banner that's here. And then right underneath that top banner is the search bar. And I'm going to see what happens if I type in, uh, uh, actually it won't be, it'll be G, G, pray, Texas wildlife. And I, it's, it's late on Friday, y'all. <laughs> Loop with two O's. Okay. Yeah, let's I see what happens. Yeah, I have it in the regular search button. I, okay, that's why it. Yeah, for some reason, when you do the regular search, it takes you to the observations page rather than yes, the actual yes, yes. home page. So that it, you were looking at the right stuff, just a different page of it. Okay, let me. Thank you very much. I think if I go this route, I'll be able to find the join the project button. Great. Yep. Yeah, what you should see, um, the banner and all that should look like this, have this cute little armadillo on it. And then you'll want to look up at the top right. And that should have your join this project. Yeah. It should, it'll should. it be just above the Texas Parks and Wildlife logo there. OK, thank you so much for your help. No problem. Sure. All right, Ann Mayville was next. Oh, nice. Anne, are you there? Okay, I'm oh, here now. There you are. <laughs> I'm, ta I'm talking away and didn't. <laughs> okay, during our break, I went out and took a picture. It's cold and there's hardly anything moving, but I had saved a black witch moth, so I took a picture of it just to practice. Mm -hmm. And so I got to uh, practice at the top, so I got practice adopt a loop project. And that's on the top of my screen. And I'm a an Android phone. And it had join, news, and about. So I hit join. And nothing came out. And you said I had to fill in um, some information. But I'm like stuck. Yeah, I have that. Yes, I'm looking at that. Go all the way okay. to the top. Go all the way to the top of that screen. And... Mine says I have three little windows that says join news and about. Okay. And this is on your phone? Yes. Yes. So when you click join, yeah. that's sh on your phone, that yeah. should be it. It's way less oh. information and stuff than it is on the website. Okay. Um, and then what you should see when you go uh, when you go back to an observation. Mm -hmm. and you you pull up the list of projects, then this project should show up now on that list. Okay. And so um, what y'all are seeing on my screen right now is on is basically the web the website view of what is in that practice project. I think, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. So what's happening here? These are the, uh, this, the kind of, um, what's the word placeholder photos that they use. Mm -hmm. So if these don't look like you're, you know, any of y'all's that's cause they're not, that's, we'd have okay. to go, I want to see the coyote here. Apologies for how long this is taking. This is this is why. Oh, look at that! Nice. It's from a game camera. Okay. So if we scroll down, here we here's the. So again, we're looking on the website, and so here um, we've got that observation field filled out. And it's in the practice adopt a loop project. So nice. Thanks for sharing. Um, that looks like a Bill made that observation. Very cool. Any other questions? So, uh, Randy and Sandra. The other Sandra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Josh. I was wondering um, where we could get a copy of the the map 
for the area that we're the adopt a loop map trail that we're uh, working on. Just shoot me an email with your address and I will send one to you. And that goes okay. for all of you guys. If uh, if you would like a copy of the map for your region, just send me your mailing addresses and I can get those sh sent out to you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then the other half, Randy, Randy I had a question. Um, so there, there's nothing special that you have to enter under eBird for these uh, observations other than just the hotspot? Correct. Yeah, that's the way we have it set up now. Um, okay. And we, we may change that in the future. Uh, we kind of started off more on the iNaturalist stuff and eBird is still in discussion as far as if we can narrow down the okay. way we pull information on that. Cool. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Donna Bailey. Um, so this is a really basic question. Uh, and um, Tanya, I think you talked about it, but I, I didn't. I didn't kind of um, get it. But so like the areas that I'm in are really, really rural. There's no Wi-Fi and even cell service is pretty bad. So I was trying to, you know, to um, share, I guess, the couple that I did. And you, they each took almost 10 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. So so when I'm out in these really rural areas, and it's going to be really slow if I'm using my phone, I'm trying to do it that way. Um, I, you talked about you can just kind of like you hold them and then you can come back to your computer and like do them, but I forget how to do that. Perfect question. Okay, let me go back to slides. Okay, so either one of these should kind of resemble what you see in the iNaturalist app on your phone. Yeah. So what you're going to want to look for is getting to that automatic upload setting. So if the dial is in another place right now, I apologize for that. Um, but what you're looking for is basically the menu. So typically that'll be like a little dial icon on the iPhone yep. or this uh -huh. thing here. Um, so when you click on that, you should okay. see under app settings, there should be something that says automatic upload. Yeah. Okay. Usually the default is that it's toggled on when you first yep. download the app and you can turn that off. Okay, perfect. Just and so it. what so what you'll see the next time once it's off, the next time you make an observation is it will take that new observation and it will highlight it and it will say that it's waiting to upload and however many are waiting to upload, it'll keep track of it at the very top. And then as soon as you're back to wherever it is that you need to be with Wi-Fi or something like that, that's when you can go ahead and click the upload button. Okay. And you only need to click it once. Great, great. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Sure, no problem. Let's see, Lisa. Let me get unmuted again. <laughs> All right. Well, first of all, I'm glad we're actually going to update these trails. I've used them for years and um, I've been frustrated trying to find the locations at times, especially if the sign's missing or I'm doing it in a backwards direction. But, uh, what I was going to ask is um, maybe, uh, Joshua, we could put together a meeting where uh, those that are working on the project can discuss things that they've had happen and how they've worked around it or what ask what, how we can handle this. I'm not getting a response, things like that. If we could just have sort of a brainstorming uh, meeting sometime in the future. I yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've actually considered and was going to email the project coordinators for each chapter uh, to see if we wanted to try to set up either a monthly or quarterly or, you know, determine how often call amongst the coordinators to kind of do that exact same thing and bounce ideas off one another and what's working, what's not working, and just continue those discussions because like I said this project is new for all of us. So it's a wow. it's a learning process as we go. And I'm I'm definitely up for well, doing that. Sometimes it can be difficult to find the sign. And of course, then sometimes it's not there. As my county commissioner pointed out, if the sign has an animal on it, it gets stolen. It, 
I did point out there was no pole nearby, so I didn't think it was stolen. I just don't think it's ever been there. But anyway, they have been stolen. <laughs> I've had that reported from private sites too along the trails. So if a sign is missing, just let me know, and we'll contact our text dot person. They're the ones that install the signs along the text dot roadway for us. But there, you know, I, like the other day, I was hunting for one a sign in particular, and it became very challenging to find where TPWD placed it. I was sort of surprised it was so far from the site. And so, I mean, these are things we can discuss among ourselves and how we've figured it out and everything. I mean, I've used Google to go find a sign because <laughs> I go down the road. All right. Yeah, that's and that's, that's uh, something that we've discussed with TechSot, and we can talk more about in a, in a separate conversation, but we're, we're aware that some of the, the signs are miles away from where they should be. So that's that's another thing that we're working on and some good feedback from from you guys as well, as far as place placement and location of signs relative to the actual site, so. And it's not only that, we found the longitude and latitude took you to a locked gate on a busy highway. You don't want an RV trying to turn into a place that is blocked and then try to get out. So uh, I think these are things that we can discuss that some people might not be picking up on that, that maybe they should be looking into. That's why I was going to suggest that. And that's that's it. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. And that's like I said, that's we've talked about that and that's something I definitely want to do. So be on the lookout for for some more information and another meeting on that topic. Oh, who's next here? Greg and Sally. Oh, boy. So I'm looking at the Explore tab or page on my phone and for previous observations there are different types of icons there's different colored circles and there's different colored teardrops can you explain what the difference between those uh, colors and shapes are absolutely okay i am pulling this up here myself just to make sure that okay so let me see here. Ah, so when you're seeing a circle um, in, and we're talking about on the phone app. So for those of you that are, that haven't looked at this before, what you're gonna see is a, a color, a circle in a particular color. There's no box around it, but it's just a open circle or you'll see like a little pinpoint. Um, so the circle actually refers to observations that are, when you look at them, that are obscured. So I just went in and clicked on something that's, that popped up near me that had a red circle around it. And it is of a, it's an observation of a wolf spider. And I can actually see when I look at the map, it tells me it's in, the te it's in Texas and it has kind of a general you know, little circle, but then it has like a little eye that's dotted. So if you see that when you look at the actual observation, that'll tell you, that'll confirm for you that it is in fact obscured. So the different colors refer to different taxonomic groups. So the green points are going to refer to plants. And I believe the red points, yep, as I click on multiple red points, those are pulling up invertebrates. And then the blue should be vertebrates. Yes. So that's how they're how they parse out color wise. Yeah, I guess I'm looking at some areas that are on the bay. And and it's some of the circles um, look like they're out of place or or maybe they're obscured such that you can't tell exactly. Yeah, you can't tell exactly where they are and it's showing um, observations in the bay for things that you wouldn't really expect to be out in the bay yes absolutely and that's that's part of how the obscured how a point works when it's obscured is they tell you up front this is not the true location of this observation but we're going to give it you're, we're going to give you a general sense so yeah if someone for whatever reason posted a photo of a feral hog and it's like hanging out in the water when clearly in the photo it's not. Um, yeah, that's why, is because it's been obscured and the randomized point just dropped it in the bay. Thank you. Helpful. Uh, let's see, Vicki Wilson. 
Uh, yes, so I had I found Adopt a Loop and all that, but our particular loop doesn't have isn't listed as a project. So can we get it listed as a project? The loops aren't individually listed. It's the entire state uh, because there's 124 loops. It would be really difficult for us to do a project for each loop. That's okay. why we have when when you enter an observation, it will ask you for the the right. description and you put in the site number. So for example, Heart of Texas East site 045. That way we once we have the site number, we know exactly which loop and site it is. Uh, but I was thinking separately, like if we wanted to just have a separate um, a project for it, just for that loop, it listed separately, not in accordance with it. So are you are you like interested in setting up your own project? Well, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, is that I mean, I don't know if that's something we would want to do, but you know, it's it probably I mean, there's probably a lot of, you know, observations there. So I just didn't know if that was a something we were we could do or somebody could do. If you have a login, anybody can set up a collection project. OK. And so the, the only challenge might be if you're talking about a site that, and I'm just putting this out there kind of as an informational. Mm -hmm. So if you have something, for example, like a state park that is a site or some other park that's in iNaturalist as a place, then you can already, you can just create a project and put that in. If someone else has already created a place for that particular park, then you just have to know what it's called in iNaturalist and um, then you can create a project around it. If it's something like a roadside site, then you might have to create your own place and that they've kind of made it a little bit more challenging to create um, places in iNaturalist. Like you have to have a certain number of observations okay. in the system before you can do that, okay. but you can kind of do that, that kind of thing. So that there, but there's nothing about setting up a collection project that would interfere with this traditional project. It would automatically pull all of that plus anything else that okay. is within those boundaries. So basically, take a lot of pictures there and then go back in and ask to do that to set up a project. Because it didn't seem like I could do that anywhere. If there's already, I mean, right now, if you wanted to set up a project, and I know counties are in there, and so that's why I use this example. If you wanted to set up a collection project for your county, you can do it in two minutes and and have it already filled with data. Okay, so that's something I can do. Yes, okay. because basically what a collection project is, is just a, it's a fancy way of, of packaging a search for, right. for observations. Right, gotcha. Okay, thanks. Let's see, um, Renee. Oh, um, let me see. I had just, I was just asking or uh, saying, uh, agreeing with Lisa that we need to have a meeting of everybody to go over all the things uh, that are involved with the adopt a loop. Yep, lots, I, agree. I have lots of questions <laughs> <laughs> that aren't related to iNaturalist today. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yeah. I, I will make that happen. That was in, in okay. the plans. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Mary? Okay. Um, when I added uh, one of my observations, um, it, it said uh, captive or cultivated. So you spoke on wild or cultivated. Is captive the same thing as wild? Captive and cultivated are going to be in the same bin. So those are different from wild. And the reason they have captive in there is because um, we'll often run across people who upload pictures of their cat or dog, or they go to the zoo and they take pictures. Okay. And so you'll have um, elephants you know, showing up in the in the list for Texas. And so it's important to just be sure to note that those are, in fact, captive animals. So that's why it's captive and then for the plants cultivated. So really the big thing that we are, you know, that that functionally 97% of the time that is the thing to be looking out for are those plants. 
because it doesn't matter if it's a native plant, if it's something that has been literally planted by a person, then we want to designate that as in that category of captive or cultivated. And so that includes restoration projects for those those first, you know, if it's a plant that's put in as a restoration project or the first generation of stuff that comes up for seed and it's squishy. So it's a, there's no uh, hard and fast rules about um, when something transitions to being kind of naturalized. But uh, definitely if it's some, it's a plant somebody put in a garden with a border, then it's cultivated. Okay, so when it says yes or no for captive, you just say no, and that would indicate that it would be wild. So if I that is correct a picture of a mushroom, I didn't cat, I didn't cultivate it, so that would be your wild. So I would just it's answer wild. no to that. Okay. Yep. Or um, or yeah, if it's so, I'm assuming you're talking about on the phone. Just yeah, the default right. is I think set phone. to no. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um. So when it says um, casual, what what is that? So casual. Let's say that you had something that is captive or cultivated, then casual basically is the, the other data quality box that something gets put into if it's not wild. So it can have, you can have it down to species level. That's another reason why something may end up, um, yeah, there's needs ID, which is basically if you don't get it down to species level, but it can be right. wild. So okay. it's maybe it's hung at genus. Um, but if you have a salvia that's in somebody's garden and you know it's you know salvia gregii, but it's in a garden and you've marked it as cultivated, then automatically it shifts from being research grade into casual. And that's because it's captive or cultivated. So that if you see something that says it's casual, that's probably why is because it's been tagged as captive or cultivated. Okay, but what if you want it ID'd? Uh, pe ID? People will, if it if it hasn't been ID'd down to the species level yet, okay. um, then people may come in and do it. If it's something that is, yeah, generally people are more looking to add IDs onto things that are wild. It may even be the, the thing if you know someone who can help you in the community, another iNaturalist user, someone else in your chapter, or someone you know is active with like Native Plant Society or something like that, then you can always, um, it's easy, I don't know if you can do this through the phone app, I know you can do it through the website, you can um, tag them. So for example, um, I always love to do this with our, our Parks and Wildlife colleague, the famous Sam Biology, Sam Kieschnick up in DFW. And so sometimes I will tag him at Sam Biology in a comment on my on one of my observations and say, hey, Sam, can you have a look at this? I'm okay. stuck. I don't know whether it's this species or that species, any tips. And then he'll get a notification on the website that says, you know, Tanya Homayun tagged you or in a observation. And that will kind of give him a, a clue that he should go maybe check and see what what I've asked him. Okay. So that may be one way to, to kind of get people's attention if you have folks you think may help you um, with those IDs, but yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, looks like we've got one more question from Ann. Okay, so I had this on my phone and I logged out. And when I come back, it tells me I have no projects. Did you log out or just close the app? I've done both. And I have no projects. Oh. Hmm. Oh. And I had the practice project up and I had the um, adopt a loops. And you're logged back into the app? I am. Mm. Wow. Now we're starting to get into the like <laughs> the app tech support stuff that we yeah. was, is. I think I had this happen before with iNaturalist, and so it has discouraged me a lot from oh. using it. Yeah, um, it's just frustrating. And it's it's another reason 
I, I'm not even going to lie. I have a very strong bias towards the website. Any of you who, who've heard me do INAT stuff before are probably not surprised to hear me say that. I, because I agree. apps are so buggy. It, you know, you do an, you do an, an operating system update on your phone and all of a sudden half of your apps don't work anymore until they catch up. So Yeah, I've had that where an app, you have to actually delete the app and reinstall it from your phone. I've had that experience with, <laughs> with some apps too. So. Yeah. so unfortunately, I don't have any... Um, this isn't, this is a platform that we, 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 um, we're like a little remora. We kind of like hang out on the big eye natural shark, but we didn't build any of it. And so right. we're kind of at the mercy of, of the developers being able to catch up with things as well. Um, and they are a nonprofit, so it, it does sometimes take a little I mean, bit of time. It, it looks like when I go back in and rejoin on my phone, everything's still there but I have to rejoin. And those hmm. projects, if you went into the website, they were, they're they probably still attached to your platform, to your um, account as well. It's, I, yeah, I wish I could say I knew for sure what was going on with why they're not showing up in your phone app, but I suspect it's one of those disconnects it, between the app and It could whatever. also have something to do with that I live in a rural location and sometimes my service is pretty lousy. It, it could be, yeah, and it could be a problem on their end of the system, too. Um, I will say when they get a lot of volume coming in, so when there are big global bio blitzes like City Nature Challenge, don't be surprised if it takes even up to a day for your stuff to show up in a project because it just is being slammed with so much data. Okay. So, so I'll just depend on my laptop instead. <laughs> But it's hard to carry. I mean, I can, I carry my camera, but sometimes the phone's just more convenient. Oh, I I know. <laughs> I I'm there. Thank you. Sure. All right, I think that is everyone, and we're at five twenty now. So <laughs> sure, everybody's ready to get their their weekend started. Um, I, this was great, Tanya. Thank you so much for sure going through all this. I learned a lot today. As as I mentioned, I'm. I'm new to the iNaturalist world myself, so I, I know this was definitely helpful for me. And thank you guys for, for hanging with us and going through the training. And if there are any other questions that you think of, obviously feel free to email me. And if it's something I can't answer, I will get with the people that can. So thank you guys so much for joining us and all the work you've already done on the project. And it's really exciting to see all these observations coming in, and I'm looking forward to, to the future of it. With that, everybody have a good weekend and we will be in touch soon. Thank you all. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Have Bye. a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.